mean, there's so many phony stories in the New York Times that we've covered over the years, and none of them oh, get yeah. retracted. No, no, no. I mean, the the thing with Judith Miller, what they did is they wrote a sort of mea culpa article years later saying that we got it wrong on some of these stories. Um, I don't I don't even think they retracted the initial stories though, but they did write a mea culpa way later on. So. Yeah, it, it, we don't know how this is going to end up and it's important to keep the pressure on. And, you know, I give the intercept credit for keeping the pressure on. Um, yeah, they the done something time, important. Yeah, yeah. no, they, their reporting here was important. They, they picked up on something that we missed, which, which is after a Z squirrel, which they're really picking up on, exposes a not yeah. short role. They found a podcast of hers in which she made some really damning admissions and they reported it on that. And they also got the story from inside the New York Times that there are people uncomfortable with Gettleman's story and that the daily the, the podcast couldn't do an episode about it. That's important. But uh I guess I guess what we're not going to get into what's unacceptable in my opinion is they're going out of their way to refuse to acknowledge the people who first debunked this story and who created the controversy around the story which they're now picking up on. Yep. Yep. I mean let's start with the Ryan Grimm and Daniel Bogoslaw article, which was an important piece, citing sourcing inside the New York Times on the New York Times decision to shelve its daily podcast based on Gettleman and Company's Hamas mass rape hoax article. Um, why did that happen? Why did it decide to shelve the podcast? Because we exposed that article, not the intercept. We did it. Electronic with, Intifada did yeah, it. Yeah. Mondo Weiss did it. Mondo Weiss doesn't get enough credit because they the, a lot of their reporting was anonymous uh, or their their debunking was done anonymously. But they yeah. did an important job. They've been doing an important job. All these three this publications and other Twitter users have been doing an important job, not only with this story but with Zaka, the fake aid, the fake rescue organization, with. Uh, all the atrocity fabrications, the Hannibal directive use on October 7th. We've been out there from the beginning. So how can the intercept tell the story of why this article fell apart and why the New York times decided to shelve that podcast without mentioning us? It is, that is itself journalistic malpractice. You're not telling your readers why it happened. They they're actually, they're actually repeating what Jeffrey Gettleman did because after we exposed Jeffrey Gettleman's fraud along with Mondo Weiss and Electronic Intifada, as we talked about earlier, Gettleman wrote that follow-up piece where he had to address his unspecified critics. He, he says the word critics multiple times. Critics, critics say this. He doesn't cite us and he doesn't acknowledge us, but he's responding to the points we raised. We raised. So basically The Intercept did the exact same thing, which is basically erase the fact that we we debunked the story that created this controversy. Um, uh, and so it, there's, it's weird there, even like they're actually emulating his behavior. Beca and why uh, we could speculate, why do even independent journalists have such contempt for other independent journalists? I mean, you know, the most charitable version is like, you know, I personally have been very critical of The Intercept. I make fun of them because they bought into all these scams that we've debunked, Russiagate, Syria Dirty War, the Hunter Biden laptop being Russian disinformation, uh, the Ukraine proxy war they were pretty weak on. I mean, we can go on and on. And so it's not nice to probably have to acknowledge people who criticize you and make fun of you, but there's also such thing as minimal journalistic courtesy. And for all my criticisms of The Intercept, I've never not acknowledged when they've done really important reporting. For example, Ryan Grimm helping to expose the U.S. rule a role in the coup in Pakistan and overthrowing Imran Khan. It's really important. And I'll always credit that, but they refuse consistently to uh, offer the same courtesy. And in this case, it's just so egregious as, and we have more examples of it. Yeah. I mean, they're, I don't know, they're kind of behaving like gatekeepers and they see themselves as sort of an alternative to, they, they, they want to be an alternative New York times. Many of their personnel and the people working on these stories are people who might've worked in the New York times uh, if the media environment was a little bit better, they, I, I know their, their culture, they all have kind of mainstream aspirations and they aspire to respectability within major American media. It's a, di it's a different mentality than we have at the gray zone where we just see the entire media as an enemy of the people. 
Uh, and I have no aspiration to respectability among them. I want the respect of you watching right now. I want to tell, I just want to tell the truth. Um, and I also think, you know, having been in media for like 20 years or more, um, journalists are the, the worst people I've ever met. Like it just attracts the worst, most narcissistic, sociopathic people. And uh, they have no ethics and they're all, most of, most of them are a bunch of frauds. Uh, so yeah, I, I kind of just, the gray zone's like a place for people who hate the media. It's like the early seasons of the Simpsons. Like when there was like, I, I was still watching the Simpsons with like an antenna with aluminum foil on it. And there was like two channels or three channels I could get. And it was like the one show for people who hated TV um, and hated TV shows and, and just the whole and hated, you know, mass American post-Cold War, cele you know, uh, uh, kind of in, this, 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 this imperial feel good culture. Like we're so happy that we have Sizzler. Um, it, it's the same thing. The Intercept, you know, it sits kind of between that and the New York Times. And right now they're trying to have their moment with all this interest in Palestine. And so they basically Israeled our content. <laughs> I mean, let's be real. They're yeah. Israeling the crap out of the gray zone. EI is calling it out. Ali, Tamara, everyone at EI is calling it out. They know that it's, it's just unethical what they're doing. And the reason that they did it is because I know this because I know their culture. And like, I know their culture because like I've been around it. Like you've been around the nation, Aaron. They don't want the word intifada in their article or to say the gray zone. You know, you look at our Wikipedia page. It's like just a complete hit job because they want the respectability of people in mainstream media. And they'll say, oh, well, we won't make the same impact if we give credit where it's due. Yeah. So we can't it's mention them. They're the unmentionables. They're yeah. untouchable. And we are part of this media Brahmin class. It's the flack filter that uh, Chomsky and Herman talked about in manufacturing consent that like, if somebody dissents uh, in a way that's too damaging to the establishment, then they're going to get flack. Uh, and uh, that will deter people from following suit and also deter people from acknowledging them. And unfortunately, people call themselves independent journalists and have done, you know, good work, fall into that. They just don't want to have the, the trouble of being associated with acknowledging people who um, actually do the work we're supposed to do as journalists. And maybe also because they don't do that work consistently on all the issues, uh, then they don't want to acknowledge people who do. <laughs> and uh, an example of that, unfortunately, is my former workplace, Democracy Now!, where I learned so much about independent media, which I'm very grateful for. But unfortunately, um, they continue to erase the work we do. Um, so this is how they framed the Intercept's latest article. A new expose by The Intercept has found major discrediting flaws in the New York Times December investigation claiming that Hamas committed systemic rape on October 7th. And they spoke to Ryan Grimm and Jeremy Scahill about it. I'm sorry, no. The Intercept did not find major discrediting flaws. Electronic Intifada, Gray Zone, and Mondo Weiss did, and The, the Intercept picked it up. And why is it so hard to just acknowledge that? Like, you know, uh, you know, I don't. I'll never be invited on Democracy Now. And I'm okay with that. I don't expect to be on interview. But if you're going to cover a story that other people have done first, you can at least acknowledge that. You know, um, and it's just so petty. It's really, really, really petty. Also said this. Uh, yet, yes, some individuals and extreme left organizations have denied these atrocities that would or be held us. them as justified resistance. Um, so, which is just such a malicious lie that someone has said that rape is justified yeah. resistance. It's an insane lie and it was never corrected. And I spoke to somebody at the intercept who I'm sure is watching right now. I'm not going to disclose who it is because I actually have ethics. I'm going to respect our private correspondence. This person defended that story and declined to do anything about it. And then now uh, the intercept is going and claiming that they have been at the forefront of, of debunking this sexual violence scam. And unfortunately, Democracy Now! did the same thing. They also parroted this Hamas uh, sexual violence story in an actually probably in, an, in a way that's that's just as embarrassing. Yeah. And, and, and so Democracy Now! is doing the same thing at the same time. I got uh, the We clip. don't have volume here. but I uh, got the clip. I, I got it. 
The UN Monday heard accounts of sexual assaults during Hamas's October 7th attack on Israel. Speakers criticized the UN and others for failing to promptly investigate and condemn sexual crimes. Former Facebook executive Sheryl Sandberg, who helped organize the event, was a key speaker. Hillary Clinton sent videotape remarks. President Biden Tuesday condemned Hamas for the alleged attacks, which the group has denied. The nonprofit Physicians for Human Rights Israel last month released a report detailing survivor accounts of sexual assaults, which it said were widespread on October 7th. Okay, this is why you really, it's really important I mean, on all stories, but especially on a story like this, you have to have evidentiary standards. And if you're going to say something like that on the air, you have to back it up. So they're actually even mischaracterizing that Physicians for Human Rights Israel report. It did not have survivor accounts. It didn't speak to any alleged survivors. It referenced basically rumors about accounts, but it didn't speak to anybody. So Democracy Now! There is totally mischaracterizing it uh, in a, a really, really... Um, unfortunate way. And also, if you're going to cite a source like that, then you should scrutinize it first. And that's what we did. And if you look at Physicians for Human Rights, Israel, one of the first things you'll see is that one of their main sources is Zaka, which is a scam group that has been caught spreading multiple other October 7th atrocity lies. And so therefore, that's immediately discrediting. If one of your main sources is a scam organization, then that taints your entire so-called report. And unfortunately, Democracy Now! didn't do its due diligence in just parroting this, while also spreading a lie that even the initial report didn't even didn't even say. Yeah. Okay, let's let's watch the rest of it. This is Orit Soliciano, head of Israel's Association of Rape Crisis Centers. She's Most of the people I assume that they have passed this kind of terror are dead because they were shocked. Uh, there are there is information from people who saw what happened, but everybody should understand there should not be any anticipation that the survivors will come and speak out loud with their face. It's not like me too. This is a horrible and different thing. Okay, well, you look like a convincing feminist, so I guess I'll just believe you. You look like a feminist from Central Casting, so it must be true. Um, Amy Goodman certainly believed it. We would just, we won't hear any testimony. We won't get any evidence. This is a different thing. And by the way, that group came out with a bogus report that we've debunked at the gray zone, which, but, CNN, uh, which CNN recently parroted in a really embarrassing way. Yeah. Yeah. But, but I mean, when, when it was uncomfortable and difficult to challenge this obvious propaganda you at the intercept and democracy now promoted it and helped israel consolidate the narrative and now that it's easy to do so because we helped clear the way because we put a grenade in the wall and blew up a hole for all of you guys to run through you're stealing all the credit and you're israeling our content and uh, it needs to be called out yeah, it would be great if basically they could just say, you know, this story, this con this scam was uncovered by Electronic Nathada, Gray Zone, Mondo Weiss. They did this, blah, blah, blah. And now we're picking, you know, if it were that, then it would be a cool story about independent media harnessing its collective power to cover, to like punch through the mainstream, yeah. cut, punch through a mainstream line. That, that's what it should be about. But uh, if someone's going to go and pretend as if, uh, we didn't do this first and we didn't expose this. We didn't create a controversy to begin with. I'm sorry. It has to be called out. Um, I, uh, it's, you know, I don't want to spend my time asking for credit, but uh, if it's, if it's being denied in such a deliberate way, it just, it has to be called out. It just really, it's just unethical. It's just basically unethical. And, uh, that's why it's important to spend time on it. Well, their piece, which I mean, is an important piece on a not Schwartz, uh, and, you know, the whole scandal around the not Schwartz, it's called, I mean, look at what it's called. I mean, again, this is, this needs to be addressed. The piece is called the story behind the New York times, October 7th expose, but it doesn't tell the story because it doesn't include us, EI and Mondo Weiss and the others who debunked this story as those who did so. 
It doesn't explain how it was debunked or how it fell apart, or how we got to a not Schwartz. Right. This is the first time that I or the gray zone has been acknowledged in their reporting. Um, you know, I went to them directly and said, are you going to acknowledge us this time now that you're looking into this and actually help point them to some research? So, and, and again, we've always acknowledged them. So they're not yeah. telling the story. So that's just not journalistic. Uh, we're referred yeah. to in passing here at the end, along with uh, Ali Abu Nema at the Electronic Intifada and Mondo Weiss. It's just not, it ain't the story. Yeah, and they, they what they do is they link to one of your tweets, which is yeah. about one issue, which is Roz Cohen, which is fine. But we did a whole story, which again, as I've said before, was mostly your work, Max. This was a lot of work you did on this. I helped out a little bit. This was mostly your work debunking the New York Times story exhaustively. And then we sent our our findings to the Times, which then forced them to respond along with what Mondo Weiss and, and, and Electronic Intifada did. And they don't link to that story for some reason. They just really want to go out of their way to not acknowledge the reporting and the investigative work that came before them. And, 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 the, and they've done it again. They did it again with uh, Zaka. They did a piece on Zaka where months ago, I dis discredited every single claim that Zaka has put out, went into how they've been uh, fundraising off these bogus claims. The piece got enormous traction and here comes Arun Gupta with a piece for the intercept on Zaka. Uh, and, and, you know, and, and so much independent media has been exposing the crap out of Zaka. American media keeps citing Zaka though. It's October 7th. Atrocity stories are discredited in Israel. And one person I cited by the way was Brad Pierce. Who's on Substack, who did an enormously important piece on Zaka before I did. And I cited him. So why didn't, Arun, why didn't Arun, I try to cite anyone who, you know, whose research I rely on or who gets to it first. Yeah. I don't care, you know, if they're, uh, you know, considered toxic. Anyway, Arun, who writes like one article a year, I don't know what he does. He's like been working on this book about like the politics of food or something for ever since I met him 10 years ago. Um, so this is his annual contribution. Uh, basically Israeling and biting my work. Um, he actually got into an exchange with Brad Pierce about why he didn't cite Brad's work on Zaka and why he didn't cite my work. And uh, it's very revealing. And so someone said wayward Rabbler, that's Brad Pierce essentially had this whole story on October 18th, which he did, which I cited the sordid history of the Zaka rescue service. And here's Arun. He had some good material, but the report is four months old. He makes factual mistakes and endorses the ghoul zone lie referring to the gray zone that the white helmets were practically an arm of Al Qaeda. Oh, okay. Which they were. So, he, so he's a Syria dirty war dupe. Okay. And that's, that's why he doesn't want to cite you maybe because he's a dupe. All right. Okay. What's like, that is the pure aisle sophomoric juvenile level that we're dealing with the ghoul zone. with intercept contributors yeah. that uh, were the ghoul zone <laughs> by the way i mean wh where did we get it wrong on the white helmets but that's it's an, it's not a it's not relevant to this no. story yeah but it just it shows actually there's a pettiness there because i mean like it's not as if i wouldn't cite the washington post or the new york times or the intercept even though they've pushed all these discredited stories like you know russia gate or the hunter biden laptop or anything else but the fact is then he's he's showing there he's like bitter about our our stance on one certain story on, which is unrelated which is Syria and therefore can't be mentioned that's just extremely petty even if we were wrong which of course we're not there's who can who can refute a single thing we've ever written about the white helmets nobody has I, but i think you know. that that is a key piece here yeah. is that we were right on Syria we exposed the white helmets while uh, Murtaza Hussein was literally taking press releases from the Syria campaign, the public relations arm of the White Helmets, and turning it into articles for The Intercept, not mentioning how the White Helmets were sponsored by British intelligence and the US government and the Qatari government, and that they were basically the mash unit of Al Qaeda, which he supported. I mean, he debated me as a non Syrian on behalf of Al-Qaeda and ISIS as why Syria should be destroyed. Uh, 
recently appeared as a non-Palestinian on the Daily Show oh, that was alongside terrible. some like ultra Zionist propagandist who's his buddy uh, on how Israelis and Palestinians can get together. And John Stewart was like, gosh, golly, why can't Hamas and Israel get together like this? Yeah, no, John Stewart was like genuinely gratified that he brought together a Muslim uh, and a ultra Zion, ultra extremist, anti Palestinian Jew to like talk as if that was some noble feat, as if this whole comp, yeah. this whole issue is like a religious one and not about a settler colonial genocidal state stealing someone else's land. Uh, that that yeah. was that was one of the worst things I've ever seen on TV. But um, yeah, sorry, Hamas and the PFLP don't want to get ahead in U.S. media by sucking up to uh, Jewish guys, so they're not going to be at the table there. Yeah, or or any there, there's so many. Palestinian voices that could have been brought on. I mean, the fact that uh, he was brought on to represent Muslims, he's not even Palestinian, is just, that's so unfortunate. And if, anyway, that was that was terrible. But, you know, since we're on the topic it's of It's just Zaka, the whole culture, this whole culture of fake alternative media, where it's mm -hmm. just wannabe New York Times media, that's what we're talking about now. They're all a bunch of gatekeepers and soft imperialists. Uh, the Palestine thing is easy for them because Palestinians are so much more powerless than, for example, the Syrian or Russian government to resist U.S. empire. And they come in late in the game when it's safe and then steal all the credit and d ignore everyone who did the initial hard work and heavy lifting and took the attacks. I mean, I got attacked like five times in Haaretz for, for what we've done. And the yeah, Washington but, Post smeared us. Yeah, and, and the Nation magazine, you know, where I used to write, uh, called us uh, rape denialists or something like that. Yeah, their top uh, second yeah. wave feminist, yeah. Hillary Clinton propagandist, Katha Pollitt, basically called us, I mean, she came as close as she could to calling us rapists. Uh, something she reserved for Matt Taibbi and Mark Ames, which didn't work out well for her. So, yeah, this is the, that whole media that we kind of come from, but we left. Yeah. It's just, it's, it, 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 it really is it's revealing itself right now. Yeah. You know, listen, it, th that is where I come from. I, you know, my formative years were at democracy. Now I learned a ton there. I'm very grateful for it. And it's just, it's unfortunate that now is a situation where the independent journalism that I do and that I'm involved in, which comes in that tradition now is somehow seen as like uh, antagonistic, like on the opposite side of my former colleagues. It, it's weird. And speaking of Syria, they bought into all that stuff too it's it's too bad and there's never any accountability um one it, thing it's like we, we we can't say it enough look at syria right now like where is the outrage when rashida talib is introducing a bill that will starve syrians when the u.s military controls one third of the country where the oil wells are when israel's yeah. attack israel just attacked damascus again and you don't hear anything from them no uh no. but they you know the u.s left the, the sort of professional left PMC left, they played their part in uh, suppressing dissent against this dirty war on Syria, which is now clearly a U.S. Israeli war. They've lifted the mask and now they're saying nothing moving right along. Yeah. And, you know, if you're seeking sort of mainstream acceptance, quote unquote, credibility, then you will still feel the pressure to pander to the narrative. And that's also what The Intercept has done with their work on the story. And, you know, listen, I understand this. I've done this before, actually, pandering to false things. Um, I didn't consciously know they were false, but so have I. subconsciously, there's an imperative. They just for, it, I understand the pressure, but they're doing this here again with this rape story. So this is Ryan Grimm on Democracy Now! today talking about, you know, the story that we did without crediting us. But this is what he says about the issue of rape on October 7th. Two ways to think about what happened on October 7th. The first way is that it was a day of extraordinary mayhem and violence. The Israeli defenses melted away. Not only did you have you know several thousand Hamas fighters stream across the fence, but you also had hundreds of civilians, some associated with gangs come across. And in that context, the idea that there would be no sexual assault is not taken seriously by pretty much anybody who understands kind of war and violence. That's one way to think about October 7th. So you see what he's doing there? He's he's trying to pander to the narrative by saying that, you know, the idea that there'd be no sexual violence is not taken seriously because this is a war after all. Well, first of all, this wasn't a war. This is actually a one-day guerrilla operation uh, with surveillance cameras everywhere. And so you can't frame this as like in the context of like a normal war. So therefore, it's quite plausible or likely that sexual violence occurred. 
this is a one day gorilla operation, which is far different than a war. And, you know, so if you're serious, you understand that. And it's second that, of all, yeah, yeah. and second of all, you don't like the standard for an allegation is not is that. Well, you know, it very well could have happened. The standard for an allegation is, is there credible evidence to support it? And in the absence of any credible ev evidence, you don't have to pander to it as Ryan Graham is doing here. And they do the same thing in their story, too. Um, there's a someone on Twitter pointed this out. Uh, her handle is Krista Peterso, uh, goes by word cited. And basically in the story, they also say they go out of their way to say this. The question has never been whether individual acts of sexual assault may have occurred on, on October 7th. Well, listen, you don't have to pander to that possibility if there's no evidence to support it. If there's actually credible evidence, you can say, you can point to this and say, this might be a case of it. But if there is none, then why are you pandering to it? You're pandering to it because you want still, quote unquote, credibility. You want to be accepted by the mainstream. You want and to be respected. You want to be respected, yeah. And so that, that's why on top of the fact that it's lame to steal credit for a story you didn't do first, um, it's lame then if you become the, if, if now people think you're the only ones debunking the story, because then the, the people who are perceived to be the ones debunking are still pandering to it which is really unfortunate. Well, Aaron, I, you just don't understand violence and war because <laughs> you're a member of the ghoul zone. <laughs> I am going to start using that. It's pretty funny. The ghoul zone. <laughs> yeah. So ghoulish to uh, debunk Imperial propaganda. <laughs> <laughs> that is I mean, what some it, people yeah. think. Yes. That actually is what people think. It's ghoulish to debunk imperial propaganda that's exactly what some people think i mean the reason why it was like <laughs> psychologically easy for me to come out and say this is bogus on a story where there, you knew the initial line of of uh, defenses you're basically denying the holocaust the reason why was because we have exposed so much imperial propaganda that places like the democracy now and the intercept have pushed over the years for example the uyghur genocide Yes. The, all, the, the, the staged chemical attacks in Syria. The White Helmets. On Albert, and on yeah. and on. I mean, yeah. there's, uh, this is just part of the playbook of Western imperialism and specifically of states uh, that aren't able or entities like, for example, the Syrian armed opposition that aren't able to achieve their objectives of regime change on their own without the assistance of the United States. And Israel needs to keep the U.S. engaged. They need to keep the air bridge of weapons coming and they ultimately want the U S to attack Iran on their behalf. So you can, you know, it was psychologically easy. Whereas these other publications that are soft imperialists or like, you know, Jeremy Scahill couldn't bring himself to talk about the dirty war on Syria, even though his book was called dirty wars. Uh, you know, in many, in many ways, he just hung up his cleats for a few years there. Uh, it's hard for them to get back in the game here or to, uh, and they, they basically had to wait to see if it was credible. Let's see if these attacks on Max Blumenthal are working. Let's see if he's getting to, Oh wait, no, uh, it, it's actually true. Okay. Let's go. Let's go guys. Everybody get on this. Uh, and then fundraise, uh, send out a few fundraising letters too. Uh, that we're doing the work on Palestine. We're yeah. leading the way. Yeah. All right. Well, um, that was therapeutic. Yeah, you know, and thanks to everybody who's acknowledged us. Thanks to everybody who's done the work along with us. Oh, wait, one more. Look at this fraud. <laughs> Mehdi Hassan has launched Zeteo, an answer to the failings of the mainstream media. Hmm. You are the mainstream media. <laughs> and what the hell is Zeteo? Is that like the Billy Blanks, like karate workout? Like what the hell kind of <laughs> name is that? I know you're going to get some good Google SEO because no one else is called Zeteo, but you, you worked for MSNBC. You were helping the mainstream media all along. And you, you yourself said Biden's foreign policy was great until October 6th. Yeah. The Ukraine proxy war occupying Syria is all great because you, you supported all that. And now you're against the mainstream media, man, everybody it's whether it's on the left or on the right, you have this fake mainstream alternative media trend where people who want to be in the mainstream and couldn't get there or who were in the mainstream and got pushed out because they said like one too many true things like Mehdi said about Palestine. They're, they're all, they're all, you know, brave, independent alternative warriors. Now they're dissidents. You know, um, I wish Mehdi luck with his new venture. I genuinely do. Uh, 
He's a talented broadcaster. My issue with him is that he left punched his way into MSNBC. And after he got thrown out, now he's back to claiming he's like the antidote to the establishment, forgetting that he got into the establishment by attacking those of us who are not the establishment. And, uh, you know, I had many spats with him because I didn't buy into Russiagate. He did. And on and on and on and on. But I, I genuinely wish some luck. I, I think anyone doing independent media um, is a good thing. I, people learning that they're not going to be able to exist inside these mainstream institutions. But already, yeah, I can see how it's going to go with him. Uh, he's going to try to, I mean, and, and this is sort of like the, this is the, the this, this is the dynamic you're talking about. It's like people uh, in independent media who, to still adopt the mainstream's talking points. And then that becomes the face of independent media. And that part is dangerous. And I look forward to fighting against that as many tries to do that uh, with this new venture. I mean, I remember that the intercepted this promo video and the thing he said is I want to write about Uyghur concentration camps. That's what I want to do. Cause he was at the intercept while he was at Al Jazeera before he was at MSNBC. It's like, I, I, I just see media as a, a tool to, educate people and get a message across and maybe change things. Um, obviously there are ethics you have to follow. You have to tell the truth, but I don't see it as an end in itself. So just because you want to stay in media uh, and something might have unfair might've happened to you at MSNBC, doesn't mean that I'm going to like support what you're doing. Uh, if you're using, if you're misusing and abusing media, um, and, you know, you can see the way he's selling it. He's selling it. Oh, it's, it's Trump is the greatest evil and the media has helped Trump. I mean, are you kidding me? The me there's I've never seen the media turn on a U.S. president like they've turned on Trump or attack him more unfairly for yeah. especially when he was trying to do the right thing, like make peace on the Korean peninsula. Uh, so that's not the reason to be an independent media. The reason to be an independent media is to give the finger to the corporate duopoly. Well, on that note, let's let me announce some good news. Someone recognized for their good work doing exactly just that, challenging the duopoly. Uh, Max has just won the 2003 Pierre Spray Award, the top prize. Um, and this is Ben Cohen, the founder of this award, announcing it. He says Max Blumenthal's rigor rigorously Max Blumenthal's rigorously researched work and October 7th testimonies reveal Israel's military shelling Israeli citizens, brought to light truths otherwise assiduously ignored in the MSM. Actually, let me read the uh, full citation. Here we go. Uh, Almost all reports on the current U.S.-backed Israeli war in Gaza come to us heavily laced with misinformation and lies. That is why the work of Max Blumenthal, who has the benefit of in-depth reporting on Israel and Gaza and previous wars in the gray zone, has been not only invaluable, but also indispensable. Most importantly, in rigorously sourced reports as, such as, and they mentioned some of your articles, um, Max Blumenthal brought to light truths otherwise assiduously ignored in the mainstream media. And I know you like this part, Max. His work has been significant enough to elicit a tribute in the form of a shoddily crafted smear job in the Washington Post. We proudly acknowledge the importance of Blumenthal's work with the Pierre Spray Journalism Award. So it's so good to see this honor. And Max, you're honored along with two other great journalists, Gareth Porter, the legend, and Dave DeCamp of Anti-War News. But, you know, like so many people, I've relied on the work you do to help us understand uh, October 7th, what really happened then, and the broader context of Israeli apartheid. And your work, is, as it says there, has been invaluable. So it's great to see you being given this honor. Well, well, thank you. And, you know, it was a group effort. Uh, we did it together. Uh, these live streams, I think, have been invaluable for people. And we did a lot of the debunking live on these streams together. Uh, I also, you know, collaborated a lot with Wyatt Reed on debunking October 7th propaganda. It's been a total team effort. And um, yeah, again, it's, 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 it's really nice to be recognized. It's harder to be recognized when you feel like you're create, helping create consciousness among people wake them up to propaganda, but it doesn't end the war. Um, and that's really, you know, the prize that I want to see. Um, I want to see our colleagues and friends stop being killed in Gaza. Um, it's an honor. It's a huge honor to be recognized alongside Gareth, um, who's worked with us at the gray zone. I've known him for many years and editing Gareth has been one of the favorite, my favorite activities at the gray zone. Cause I learned so much from his pieces. 
he puts so much scholarship. He blends scholarship and journalism in such a masterful way. And uh, we're going to, we're going to be publishing an, I, th I think we're going to be publishing a new Gareth Porter piece next week. Um, and Gareth is, uh, he's in his eighties. Um, and he's still just doing a masterful job putting Joe Biden to shame. And Dave DeCamp uh, is holding it down at antiwar.com. Um, just he's a, he's incredibly prolific. Every day he has at least one, several articles uh, breaking down the most important issues. So it'll be great to be recognized uh, with them. And yeah, huge thanks to the committee and to Ben Cohen. Pierre Spray, someone I got to know very late in his life, who is an iconoclast and kind of a um, defense industry whistleblower who helped design the F-16, but then blew the whistle on the later designs and how wasteful they were. He was also anti-war activist, um, someone I met through Fritzy Cohen at the Tabard Inn, um, and you know, which is one of the last kind of sanctuaries for the anti-war movement in Washington, D.C. And he also um, made some innovations in sound design. He ran, a lot of people don't know, Pierre Spray ran a recording studio, was a jazz aficionado and designed uh, speakers and did sound design. I think it's called Maplewood, Stu Maplewood his company. Um, but anyway, uh, I couldn't ask for a better award to get. And I know that and, and, and I know this award because you won it very deservedly last year, Aaron, for your work on the OPCW and the Syrian Dirty War. Well, you know, uh, it was always awkward for me that I won an award like that uh, and you didn't. So this makes me feel a lot better that finally you get recognized for all the work you've done. Because again, you know, as I said last year when I won the award for uh, the for the Syria work is that, you know, that wouldn't have been possible without you. Again, similar similar with this New York Times rape scam story, you led the way in debunking it first, creating the space for me to come in and follow up with the work I did on the OPCW scandal. So this is very, very fitting. It's great to see. And um, yeah, I look forward to celebrating with you.